Thanks, Joe. That was really good. Really well done, as per usual. Thank you, worship team, for uh, leading us in worship this morning. And uh, just real sense, a real sense of God's presence here this morning. And I just want to, uh, I just want to honor the Lord and His presence here this morning, Father. Your presence in our lives is such a blessing. And Lord, in this moment, we just, we just stop and we say thank you, God, for your presence. Lord, we thank you for your presence here this morning. We thank you for your presence in our life. And we ask, God, that you would forgive us, Father, when we take your presence for granted at times, Lord. At this moment, God, we just stop and we say thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being with us and making yourself known. Lord, I just sense you're ministering to people this morning, even in the worship. And, and Lord, I just declare that you're going to minister to people this morning as, as the word goes out. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would have your way, that you would speak to our hearts and change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I would like to, before I get into my message, I would like to thank uh, Melissa Hartman for her leadership. Um, uh, yeah, you can give her a hand for that. Uh, I never, ever felt comfortable wearing my ripped jeans in church. But Melissa Hartman has led the way Sunday after Sunday with her ripped jeans, and now I feel that I can go there too. And I, so I want to thank you, Melissa. And I also want to thank you for your worship leading, but I really feel comfortable in my ripped jeans this morning. So thank you. That, that's you. That's on you. And I, that's an important thing to me. You've, you've made a difference here. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Got that out of the way. I want to thank everybody for being awesome this morning and being here with us. Um, your presence here is meaningful. You, your presence here in this church every Sunday morning, it, it's meaningful to God, but it's meaningful to us as pastors that you take your time to come to this place and, and worship with us. And um, we are in a, a season of transition here at the church, and your presence is more meaningful than ever as we go through this transition. And so we just, pray, uh, we just ask for your prayers and um, um, just keeping us in your thoughts and your prayers as we, as we ask God to give us wisdom and direction as we move forward with the church. My sermon this morning is going to ask a question, and I don't want this title up there yet, but I, we'll have it up there in a moment. Really, my sermon this morning is going to deal with the question, what do you do when the blessing becomes a burden? What do you do with that? Um, an example from my own life, so I remember when I, I stepped out in ministry for the first time and overcame fear and overcame insecurity and had this dream to preach but never ever thought that was something that uh, could ever happen. And then when it did happen, when God opened the door for me to go into ministry and it did happen and God was using me and, uh, on a weekly basis and in the youth ministry back in Creston, ministry was such a blessing in that season of my life. Every, you know, the, the pay was terrible, the hours were unreal, but that, none of that mattered because God was moving, kids were getting saved, and, and God was using me, and I had fresh vision, fresh passion for my life. It seemed, it, it seemed to me that I could do this forever, and if I could just stay in this kind of this zone in my life, and I kind of, well, I was young, and I didn't understand that it wasn't always going to be that way. In that, in that season of my life, ministry, even though it had, to, it had a cost, and it, they, like I said, the pay wasn't good, the hours were terrible, but it didn't matter because it was such a blessing to, be, to, to just be used by God and, and being in that place where you, never, you just had always dreamed you would be but never thought you would be there, and it was such a blessing. But it, over the years, there's been seasons in my life where being in ministry didn't feel like a blessing. In fact, it, it often felt like a, a real burden. And some of those, like, seasons, those seasons were really, really extended seasons. And, um, 
But as a pastor, I'm not alone in that. The, the burnout rate for pastors is, is through the roof. And um, they, every young pastor starts off feeling like, what a blessing. But somewhere along the way, that has become a burden for them. Some other examples of when the blessing becomes a burden. You know that the divorce rate is just as high in the church as it is in the world. What, what happens? What do you do when you're this marriage? You were so excited about it. And, and I've done weddings where I've seen the bride look the groom in the eye and vice versa and declare their unending love. And this is such a blessing, and somewhere along the way, that blessing turned into a burden. And what do you do when the blessing becomes a burden? Other example would be, have you ever prayed for a job? Have you ever been unemployed? And you said, God, I need a job. Lord, I, I need to provide for my family. Lord, I don't care where it is or what it is. Lord, if you would just open the door. Lord, I'll walk through it. Lord, whatever I have to do. Lord, I just need a job. And, you, and, and then all of a sudden, you go, to, you go for that interview, and you're just like, oh, I hope I get this job. I hope I get this job. Oh, God, what a blessing it would be if I got the job. And you get the phone call, and they say, hey, we want to offer you the job. And you go in, and, and you're all excited, and you go through the training, and, and, and you're, you're, you do, you'll go above and beyond because you're just so excited excited that you've been blessed with this job, you can feed your family, you can pay the bills, and it's such a blessing, but now you've been there for 10 years, and it's no longer a blessing in your life, but it feels like a burden, and 8 o'clock in the morning rolls around, and oh man, could I just, maybe I could call in sick, I, I, think, my, I think I have a sore throat, I don't know, I, oh yeah, I think I am sick, I am sick, and you fall, because, it's, because the blessing, it, it went from being a blessing, and at some point, this blessing turned into a burden. What do you do when the blessing becomes a burden? I remember, I have sat with families, with parents, who have a newborn child. And, and that child, you're in the hospital and you hold your baby in your arms for the first time and it's, and you're, it's such a blessing to have that baby and you, you have all these, I remember holding Faith in my arms, uh, my, my firstborn and it was such a blessing and all the things you dream about and you think about for your children, but I don't know if you've ever sat with a parent whose child has, who, who has, is caught up in the throes of drug addiction. And you talk to them about how they can't sleep at night. And they don't know where their children are. And they, 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 they won't hear from them for days. And they wonder if their child's even dead. And all of a sudden, this thing that was such a blessing is now a burden. A heavy, heavy burden. What do you do when the, the blessing becomes a burden? But what do you do when that blessing is your faith in Jesus Christ? You ask Jesus into your heart and you're, you're so excited. Free from the fear of death, forgiven for all your sins, so excited that you, you're going to take on the world and you're, you're going to tell everybody about your faith in Jesus and what he's done for you, how he set you free. What do you do when it no longer feels like a blessing and it feels like a burden? What do you do? You can walk away from a marriage. It happens all the time. I've even seen people say to their, their children who are drug addicts, you're not welcome here anymore. You can quit a job. You can even quit ministry.
but can you walk away from Jesus? So what do you do when the blessing becomes a burden? The title of my message this morning is Hold On. You have to hold on. And this is, the, this is nothing new. This idea of our faith becoming a burden, this is, this is nothing new. This is something that they actually experienced even in the New Testament church. And we're going to look at that this morning. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Hebrews. The scripture will be on the screen as well. But uh, we're going to be uh, exclusively in the book of Hebrews this morning. And the, uh, it's important for us to understand the context of, uh, of this message in this book. Um, so I found um, a nice little Coles notes, if you would, that will give us the context of the book of Hebrews. And so I'm just gonna, it'll be on the screen. I'm just going to read it. It says, the book of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians. They were Jews who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed he was the Messiah, the promised Savior who had fulfilled Old Testament scriptures, but they were now tempted to abandon their faith in Christ and to return to the Old Testament. The cause of this was persecution. These Jewish Christians were being, were being reproached and mocked by their fellow Jews. The unbelieving Jews said things to them such as, Why do you believe in Jesus Christ? Why do you follow him? Why do you turn your backs on the temple and now worship God in a new way, the way prescribed by the man Jesus? Don't you see that he was a failure, as was evident from the fact that his life ended in disaster? Don't you realize that you are deluded and foolish to follow Christ? That's the way they were, we were, uh, were reproached. And thus they were tempted to abandon their faith in Jesus Christ. That's why they needed to hear the admonition of the text. Hold fast the profession of your faith. Because they were tempted to forsake Christ, they were told, do not let go of what you believe and what you have confessed concerning him. Do not crumble because of persecution. Stand firmly in the faith that you have, confess, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And do that without wavering, without swervering one, uh, swavering, swerving one way or the other. Hold fast to the profession of your faith. There was a season in, this, uh, in these Jewish Christians' lives where they had accepted Jesus and that was a great blessing to their life. But now their faith, uh, over the years, as they were being persecuted, there was years and years and years of persecution. They had been waiting for some sort of breakthrough. They had been waiting for some, something to change. The change never came. And, and there was a cost to their faith. And, and some had already turned away. The, book of the, the, the writer of this book, we don't know who it is. We don't know, it's, it's, uh, some believed at one point that it might be Paul, but we generally don't believe that Paul wrote this book. We don't, gen we don't really know who the writer of this book is. Some believe it was Apollos, the great New Testament preacher. What we do know is that whoever wrote this book was an influential church leader who was well-respected and honored amongst all the known believers of the day. And he writes them this letter because they are tempted to fall away because the society in which they lived made it inconvenient for them to have this faith. Their faith was not celebrated. Their faith was not honored. Their faith was mocked. Their faith was reproached. And the reason that people said to them that they were foolish is because you can't give us any physical evidence that this faith is giving you any kind of success in your life. They said if Jesus would have been real, he wouldn't have died on a cross. He would have overthrown the Romans. He would have set us free from the Roman tyranny. And, and he would have had a kingdom here on earth. Why would you believe in somebody who they, the Romans hung on a cross? 
How can he be the Messiah? That's not what we expected. And, and so it is in our day. We live in a North American culture and society where I'm telling you, it, it, is, not, it is not celebrated that you are a fundamental Christian. That the, the simple doctrines that we have believed for thousands of years, they say, they say, if you believe that, you're stupid. And so what we need is influential Christian leaders, not to, not to write books telling us hell no longer exists. We don't need influential Christian leaders saying we should change this doctrine or we should change that doctrine because culture doesn't really want to embrace that. What we have here is an influential Christian leader addressing people who are being told their faith is antiquated, foolish, and stupid, and he's not coming to them saying, you know what, well, if we just change a few things here or there and we make it more appealing to the, to the, the palate of the people around us, I think we can get away with this. No, he says to them, you have to hold on. We need somebody to, 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 to rally the church this morning and say to them, look, we're not changing everything so we can be accepted. The church, the world needs the church to embrace the power and the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church needs to stand up for the faith that we have, that he died on the cross, rose again, he's resurrected, and he's coming back. And we just need to, we need to stand up and say, this is what we believe. This is who we are. We're not going to waver right is right, wrong is wrong, black is black, white is white. And this is what the influential Christian leaders of the New Testament church would do. And that's what we need. More than ever. For them, their faith in Jesus was a burden in the physical. And it wasn't for a few weeks. It wasn't for a few days. It wasn't for a few months. This has been going on for years and years and years. And so this writer writes them this letter. And I just want to quickly go through a few of the, 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 the things that he said and have stuck out to me this week. Because I got to tell you, sometimes in my own life, I said, Lord, I feel so burdened. And what I feel the Holy Spirit saying to me is, hold on. Hold fast. Stand firm. But Lord, I've been believing for greater things, and those greater things haven't come. I, I hear him saying, hold on. Hold fast, stand firm. I, I, I believe there's parents here who are, who, when I talked about the, the, the example of children, I, I want you to know, I just believe you've been waiting, you've been believing, you've been sleepless nights, uh, 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 worry, anxiety. I feel this morning the Holy Spirit saying to you, hold on, stand firm. Uh, there, you, you're in a job right now and it's become this burden. It's become, you, you just, it sucks the life right out of you. And you're saying, God, I don't know if I can do this. God's saying, hold on, hold fast, stand firm, don't quit. There, there, there is something about a, a, a believer who says, I will hold on. I will stand firm. I won't go to the right or to the left. I won't just be easily swayed. I won't just take the easy road. I will hear from heaven. I will get a direction and I will stand fast. That's what you do when the burden, when the blessing becomes a burden, you get into the presence of God, you get a direction, and you hold on. And church, God is saying to you today, hold on. Hebrews 2 verse 1, we'll hop right into it. He says this, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. This is what I, I sense is happening in the church. We've had, we've had solid Christian doctrine for 2,000 years. And now more than ever, when, when our faith is being questioned, mocked, and ridiculed, now more than ever do we have to pay close attention to the fundamentals of the faith. 
pay close attention. We can't just put these things on the shelf because they don't, they don't appeal to everybody. We can't write them away. We can't pretend that they don't exist. We, we, have, to, there, we have to understand that sin, the wages of sin is death. Grace is not a license to sin, but actually a supernatural ability given to us by God to do right. And we just got to begin to, we got to hold on to, we got to pay attention to the fundamental truths of the faith. When we have Christian leaders writing books, influential Christian leaders writing books saying to us, you don't have to worry about heaven or hell and eternity, we got to hold on. We got to pay attention. We got to pay attention to what we have heard. I'm glad you had an experience at an altar one day. I'm glad that you went to Sunday school. I'm even glad that you went to Bible college. I'm glad that you've got all this training. But if you don't pay attention to what you've learned, I'm glad that you've sat in church for the last 20 years, but it's not that you were there. It's that you become doers of the word, not just hearers. That we got to pay attention now. That, that this book, we have to apply this book and the, these truths to our lives. It can't just be something that's out there that we've just kind of put up. Oh, the word of God is powerful. And we make it mystical. And God's saying, no, no, yeah, it's powerful. But you got to apply it to your life. And then he, he, in, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8, he, he says this, During the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me through the 40 years, they saw what I did. That is, that is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are going astray, and they do not know my way. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. So he, we, here we have a Jewish Christian leader writing a letter to people who were once religious Jews. So as religious Jews, a good number of the people that he's writing to would have memorized, word for word, the first five books of the Bible. And so now he's, so he, this New Testament writer takes them and he points them back to the Exodus story. Which they, he doesn't need to explain that story because they've all memorized the story. They know that story so well. And he points them back to that story and he says, you know this story that's thousands of years old? He says it has something for us today. And he, and he reminds them about the Old Testament believers who, who cried out for freedom and, and God answered and he parted the Red Sea and he set them free and, and they went out on their way and, and they're in the wilderness and they're hungry. They cry out for food and God sent food from heaven and, and they, all these miracles. And on their way to the promised land, he reminds them that they grumbled and they complained and, and they were excited for God when God was doing everything they wanted. But whenever there was adversity, they would grumble against God. They would grumble against Moses and they were, they were wavering all the time. Their faith was constant constantly wavering to the point where God finally said enough is enough and you can't go into the promised land. And this New Testament writer says, and that is how God deals with us today. He said, if, we, if that's the way we're, we're going to be in our New Testament faith, now that we have, uh, we have salvation through Christ Jesus, he says, we can't be like them. We have to be, we have to be firm. We have to be stable. We can't be double-minded. We have to know who we believe. We got to know what we believe. And when it doesn't, when, when we have adversity and it, it, it isn't convenient, we still have to stand firm. We still have to hold on. Because he says to them, here in Hebrews 12, 3, 12 and 14, he says, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. This is it. This is number, verse 14. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold firmly to our original conviction to the very end. He says, it wasn't about being set free from Egypt. It was about stepping into the promised land. If all you do is step out of Egypt and die in the wilderness, what's the point? He says, you got to hold on to the very end. 
and you got to walk in the promise. You got to persevere. You got to push through. You can't, you can't just waver back and forth. He said, you know, God set you free. You've experienced his love and his goodness. You've tasted and seen that he is good, and that is great. But what are you going to do? What are you going to do when the blessing becomes a burden? When you don't get the breakthrough right away, when you don't get the, the, what you want right away, or you, the promise is slow in coming, and, you know, the Bible says hurt, hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. What are you going to do? You've got to hold on. He's writing to a group of people who are tempted to walk away from the faith because of the cost. These Jewish Christians, it, it was costing them relationships. They were being disowned by their families. They were, it was costing them their jobs and their livelihood. Their land was being taken away because of their faith. It's great when you have a, a warm, fuzzy feeling at the altar, but when you go home and they're taking all your stuff and they're kicking you out, you can't live on feelings. If you share and sin, your heart becomes hardened by sin's deceitfulness, he says. Well, how will I know? How will I know those who are, who are truly, truly believers? And, and he says this, it's not going to be because they can do miracles. It's not going to be because they, because they know all the Christian language and they know how to quote Bible verses and they, and they know how to sound spiritual. He said, you know, you're going to know, you're going to, you're going to know because they're going to hold on to their original conviction right to the very end. To the very end. God's not looking for starters. He's looking for finishers. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10 to 12. Somebody needs to hear this this morning. Somebody needs to hear this. I believe that God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as, he's, as you've helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end so that your hope may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to intimidate, uh, uh, imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Listen, it's not about being set free from Egypt. It's about walking in the promised land. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work. You see, sometimes when you're holding on, sometimes when you're, you're being faithful day after day after day and you're believing for that breakthrough or it, it, you're doing all the right things but you just don't seem to have this breakthrough. That's what, that was what, that's what was happening to these Hebrew Christians is they were Christians for a long time. And they, they thought, you know, eventually things are going to change. Eventually things are going to get better. They weren't getting better. And the writer doesn't say to them, you know what, in a couple of short months, everything's going to get better. That promise isn't given. But what he does say is, God sees. God knows God is righteous. God is not unjust. And I, don't, I can't make you a promise that it's going to look a certain way. And I can't, I can't tell you when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen or how it's going to look. But I tell you this, if you quit now, you're going to get a just reward. You're going to get what a quitter gets. But if you hold on, I want you to know God is not unjust and he will reward you. And he says you will inherit what has been promised. He says, if you hold on, there's a promise. God has not set you free from Egypt to die in the wilderness. And he goes back to that promise. When 
When he says, when he uses that language, promise, he's again pointing them back to that generation. He said, then in that generation, two men had faith. In that generation, two men had patience. And he said, God saw. God saw. He saw Joshua and Caleb. And he's saying to that New Testament audience, he's saying, God's looking for Joshua and Caleb's. He's looking for Joshua and Caleb's here. You, and he says, you Hebrew, you Hebrew Christians, you could be Joshua and Caleb's. But he said, he really, he said the majority of them became lazy. They became, they became overwhelmed. They became discouraged because of the thought of going into the promised land. And, it, oh, it's good enough here if we could just stay on this side of the Jordan. We could, pay, we could make a life here. And, and, and so they decided, a lot of them stayed on this side. But two men had faith. Two men had patience. And he says, these are your examples. The the, the road is narrow. The Bible says the road is narrow, but if you do it, there is a promise. There is a promise for those who hold on. There's a promise for those who stand firm. He says God saw Joshua and Caleb. He saw their faith. He saw that they were patient. He saw that they were firm and they inherited the promise. And I declare that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God sees your firm. God sees your faith. God knows your heart. And God says, I'm not, making, I'm not going to tell you how it is. It may not look how you want it to look. But he says, I see it. And I declare that I am faithful and I am just. And you will inherit a promise. And I'm not going to say that you're going to be rich. I'm not going to say it's going to be fulfilled a certain way. But I am going to say, above all else, God is faithful. Amen. And that cannot be shaken. That cannot be changed. He reminds them, and I'm finishing with this. He reminds them, remember those earlier days. After you first received the light, you, you first asked Jesus into your heart. When you endured in great conflict, full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly expo exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had a better and lasting possession. So don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will Receive the promise. Amen. He says to them, this is what I love. He says, remember when this thing that so burdens you now. Remember your faith. When it used to, you didn't see it as a burden. You saw it as a blessing. Remember when you were so in love with Jesus. He was so real to you. The experience of knowing that you were free and forgiven outweighed even the confiscation of your property, even being put in prison. Like you joyfully accepted that because you were so focused on what Jesus did on the cross. You were so focused that he died on the cross and he rose again and you knew he was coming back. You had a greater hope. You had a greater possession. You had a greater kingdom and that's where your focus was. And so you weren't burdened. You were blessed. But now your focus is on everything in the natural that is costing you. And he says to them, if you want to hold on, you got to focus on the blessing. you got to focus on who he is. you got to remember the benefits of the Lord and you you gotta thank him for them. You gotta remind yourself of them. You gotta keep back going back and visiting that altar of thankfulness and put your heart and your focus on, on him because that's how you hold on. You focus on the fact that he's your blessing. He's your all in all. No one can take it away. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, no one can take away that covenant that you have with him. He says, I promise you, if you hold on, he's gonna come through. And that's my promise to you today. 
If you persevere, if you persevere, when you've done the will of God, you will receive the promise. And then he says this, Hebrews 11, 1. Because they're thinking, man, if I just had something I could hold on to, if God could just put something in my hand, like a physical reminder or, or a physical fulfillment of a promise, so I can just hold it up for everybody to see and say, hey, look, see, I was right. I was right. Look, I'm holding this physical reminder, whether it was a, something physical, whether it was a, a big pile of money or, or you know, they, something everybody could see. But he says this, faith is confidence in what we hope for, an assurance about what we do not see. He says, I'm not going to give you something you can hold on to. I'm not going to give you something that you can, you can stand up all cocky and arrogant and say, see, look, I'm a success. Look, you can't, you can't doubt me now. He said, no, no, no. You need faith. You, faith in what you hope for. Confidence in what you do not see. Assurance about what you hope for. Just stand up this morning. I'm going to pray that God, I'm just going to pray this morning before I release this with a blessing that God would increase your faith. Well, how do I know that that's going to happen? Dennis, how do you know God's going to do that? Because I just preached my heart out. I just preached like I was 23 years old. Like I was, I got nothing in the physical that I'm putting my hope in. Everything right now is just in this book. The Bible says that we need to move and act in faith. Father, some of us right now, we just feel like we don't have any faith. Father, we talked about the, the, the blessing becoming a burden. And, and for so many people, that it looks so different. For some, it's, it's a child. For some, it's ministry. For some, it's a marriage. For some, it's a job. For some, it's, it's so many different things. But we don't care what it is, God, because everything is under your feet this morning. We declare that you are in control. And we've all been given a measure of faith. Your word declares that, God. That's where our hope is this morning. We've all been giving a, given a measure of faith. And so, Lord, I just declare in Jesus' name, and I release it in Jesus' name, faith to rise up in each and every heart. Lord, the faith of Joshua and Caleb. I pray for those here that are here this morning who said, I don't know if I can hold on any longer. I just pray, I just declare that you are a Joshua. I declare that you are a Caleb. I declare that God is faithful, that God is just, and you're gonna see God come through in your life. I declare in Jesus' name that your faith is rising right now. I declare it because the Holy Spirit is moving and, and, and just to and fro throughout this room. I just declare that faith Faith is rising. Discouragement is just melting in Jesus' name. I just declare dreams and visions are just being reborn. God, I declare the Holy Spirit. Nobody's going to come speak to you. I declare the Holy Spirit is going to speak to your heart this morning. And you're going to leave this room today encouraged. You're going to leave encouraged. I believe right now that people are going to watch online. And encourage is going to meet you where you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I just pray your blessing upon these people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Be blessed as you go and have a great week. Amen. Amen.